All right, y'all need to. Is everybody in this room insured as far as work comp for us? No. I believe all the counties that are here are in the workers' compensation program. Okay. Yeah. So if you have issues with work comp, come see me. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk a little bit about trying to keep your employees safe and uh, understand we're dealing mostly with uh, facilities uh, in the room today. So I'm, I'm just curious, what kind of challenges do you face uh, with trying to keep your people safe? What kind of injuries do you see in facilities? And, uh, what are your challenges with safety? Any feedback on that? Slip trips and falls are always a big issue. Okay. I can't keep the sidewalk from the public and doing their thing. They, they told me last time I was there, a quarter inch is, is as much as you can have with them before you have to red tag it or mark it and do that. And I said, That's not much. My, my, and they, the solution was just paint it. And I said, well, my front yard or my building is going to look like a, a, a carnival because you're going to have all those colors. All the way around the, the building because a quarter inch is not that much. And I, I said, well, they came out and did the, uh, what was that? Mary, when she was here, the handicap, came and, and did our parking lot. And they red tagged all of our safety things for the handicap people. So we ended up with ripping off handicap signs and all kinds of things. And we spent $50,000 redoing the parking lot because of these. Dips and lifts in, in the entrance of the building. And what it turned out happening is the older people had to walk another 300 yards to get to the building because mm -hmm. the handicap now wasn't right next to the building because there used to be a six inch rise from the wheelchairs that the people were walking. So change one uh, now. to go way out yeah, there. Yeah, one exposure for another. We got rails and everything <laughs> that we got put in to do that. It really caused us a lot more. So slips, trips, and falls. What else do you see? Crystal, back I said injuries. I was going to call on you. <laughs> back injuries. Okay, back injuries. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, looking at the uh, five-year history of uh, claims from the counties here in this room, um, it's interesting. You know, you have your sheriffs, you have your, your jails and uh, EMTs, fire. They all kind of have their unique types of claims and injuries that you see. I guess on the good side, um, I see very few claims from facilities. Um, a good thing. Um, but what we do see is probably revolves what you've talked about, slip trips, falls. I see falls from ladders. We see falls from heights, uh, material handling strains. And probably, I'd say those top three, the, the third one would probably be hand injuries some type of hand cut contusion, um, working with tools or just material handling and, and hurting the injury. My little, uh, my little video clip's not gonna work here today, so we're gonna skip that. But, so my topic today is helping employees make the safe choice. You know, we do a lot with regard to training. And I don't, why, why do we train? I mean, they've got to know how to do the job and do it right. And so I think our emphasis is trying to make sure they know how to do it right. True. And document what you do so you uh, control your liability there. But is there any guarantee that uh, what training we do will motivate them to make the safe choice and do it right? Not, not typically. You see this picture here on the, on the left here versus the guy doing it right with fall protection. Uh, here they're kind of, well, at least they're improvising. I guess he's out there with no um, safe lifeline at all, but I guess I would take it that if he did fall, he's probably not gonna be able to keep him from going to the ground. I'm not sure how far up he is there, but uh, I've been doing a lot of ladder, safe ladder training lately with some municipalities and it's interesting um, you know I mentioned regardless of how often we train they know how to use a ladder safely a lot of times they don't do it 
And I, I suspect there's a number of reasons behind that. Maybe they don't have the proper tool for the job. A ladder is a tool just like any other tool we use to accomplish the job. Uh, this guy, I guess, on the left here, you got to give him, uh, give it up for uh, ingenuity. But uh, I suspect he probably didn't have the proper ladder for the job, and so he improvised and didn't get hurt doing it, which just reinforces that bad decision making or poor behavior of, of taking a risk by doing this sort of thing. This job here in the middle here, they could probably better serve what they're doing with a scissor lift or maybe even a taller A-frame ladder. Uh, decision making. Uh, it's interesting a lot of times they improvise to get the job done, but many times when they improvise, they're also compromising their safety. And like I say, sometimes you get away with it, and sometimes you don't. I was talking to a gentleman who'd been on the job 25 years installing and repairing garage overhead doors. Had never fallen in his life from a ladder. And then uh, about two, three years ago, last December, he was up on an extension ladder, about 14 feet up. They had actually warned him beforehand, the company owners there were servicing this overhead door, that they had had a spill over there and, you know, check the floor, it might be a little slick. So he, he checked it, didn't see anything wrong, and so he went up. Down, I think he told me he'd gone up and down seven times. And then on his last time up, the ladder kicked out on him, 14 feet up. But he came down like this on both elbows and had, I think it was 56 fractures in this elbow and 48 fractures in this elbow. And uh, they told him in the hospital that night with the potential for infection, especially when you have that many fractures, they wanted to be up front with them. You could e likely easily lose your arms but the elbows, both of them, because of uh, this injury. Fortunately, he did not. He did lose some range of motion. Um, to this day, and I just talked to him about mm, three or four months ago, so it's been three years, to this day he still cannot get on a ladder. And so they've had to change his job description. Still works for the company, but he does not do what he did for 25 years. All because, well, there was a couple of factors involved with this. The floor and the ladder wasn't set up properly, and he could have secured the ladder. Now, had he been trained how to do that properly? Yes. Was there means of even securing the ladder? They had a procedure for that. But for some reason, made the decision not to follow those rules or what he'd been taught. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, how do we best influence the behavior, that decision making of people when they've been trained properly how to do things and yet they don't do it. And, um, you know, as you look at incidents, and I pour over incident reports uh, periodically of uh, injuries that have happened. There's inevitably, when you look at contributing factors and even root causes of, of incidents or injuries, inevitably there's always going to be a human component to it. And it's a decision-making process. Um, now there's other factors involved, but uh, this is probably the biggest one and probably, and I'm just throwing out a number there, but I would say probably at least 70 to 80 percent of the incidents that we see, typically the contributing, main contributing uh, factor in the injury was that decision making. They knew how to do it right and for some reason shortcut. And uh, we'll talk about that, why people do that. Before we go on to that, I mentioned training, and really there's no study that I know of that, that associates training with motivating somebody to do the right thing, uh, do it the way they've been taught. But we've got to take the time to do it. Uh, that, to me, is the low-hanging fruit. People at least have to know how to do the job right and safely 
And then they're going to make the decision themselves whether or not they follow that procedure or those procedures. Uh, but it's our due diligence to at least provide that training. And as this gentleman said, we have, a, uh, I think, a moral obligation as well as, uh, you know, there's a liability exposure to us if we don't do that. And uh, certainly that's what OSHA requires of us, to provide a safe work environment for employees. So we have to train. We have to document that training. And honestly, I find that the human factors involved with training, if you do it properly and right, uh, are reduced when employees demonstrate a skill proficiency before performing a particular task. So, can you think of any of the training you do now where you train somebody how to do something properly and then you have them demonstrate that back? before they're expected to perform that skill. Our forklift training. Okay. And honestly, I think that is the only one, as far as from an OSHA perspective, that we require that. And I don't know why that is. Uh, but yeah, that is uh, that standard there where we... There's a classroom portion. We train on theory and proper operation and operating rules. And then we go out and we and we do a practical test, and they demonstrate their skills and proficiency in what they've learned. Uh, and then you mentioned driving. That's probably another one. Uh, if we do that, how many in here do driving tests for employees? Okay, no one. You do? Well, yeah, they come from a lot of Okay. a lot if we hire people and expect them to know things and driving is probably a classic example of this I mean, uh, but you think of probably the most dangerous thing any of us do every day is get behind the wheel of a vehicle and driving out on the roads and unless maybe you're law enforcement or something along that line where you may encounter but yet I find very few people do training with regard to defensive driver training or even go out and doing a road test. If you're hiring a person and they're going to be driving a county vehicle, wouldn't it be incumbent on, uh, upon us to make sure that they're a safe and reasonable driver? Uh, probably. Now we, we may check for their MVR, their motor vehicle report, look at their past driving history and that's one thing we could do. And I hope that at least we do that. But Bottom line is uh, we still have no idea what kind of driver they are without taking the time to maybe even do a road test. So that's a big liability exposure uh, there. So my point in bringing this up is on your training. Uh, and I always like to use this little uh, learning pyramid here. Uh, people really learn something and learn something well if you actually have them practice doing that or like the forklift standard, even uh, demonstrating that skill, or even teaching others. Uh, if you have periodic safety meetings uh, within the county, anybody here assign out maybe safety topics and have, rotate that through and have somebody maybe provide or present a topic? Hmm, an excellent way to not only get that person to probably really know the topic, but then he shares that with others. And, and taking the idea of rotating that through and giving others uh, an opportunity to do that really, I think, reinforces that, uh, that learning. So I'd recommend uh, maybe examining, uh, examining your training and uh, seeing if there are opportunities for you to do things like we do with the forklift stand, where you train. I mean, even something as simple as a ladder. Have a little uh, toolbox topic on ladders and then go out to the shop and, and have somebody demonstrate setting up the proper angle on a ladder or how to set up an A-frame ladder and, and how to properly use it. You know, a, a good, I think, training technique. Um,
talk about providing the proper tools for the job. Do you think management, uh, in this situation here, or maybe this is management, I don't know, but didn't have the right tool for the job, and so they have this attitude of basically get her done at all costs and rig up something like this just to be able to get the job done. Or even this ladder situation on the left. Uh, I don't know, I think for the most part, and, and as I'm out and about and visit with public entities, I think for the most part, people are provided with the proper tools to do the job. But that they are probably not prepared for the job. Now let me give you a good example of this. Work with this company that if you want to re-roof your house, put a new roof on a new house, they come out and they, they load the shingles up for you on your house. And a uh, couple of ways they do it. Well, the old way, when I used to help my dad do it, you just put the shingle bundles on your shoulder and up the ladder you'd go. It was pretty rough work. Then they for the most part now they have a big conveyor mounted on the back of a truck and they'll throw them on the conveyor and they got a guy on the truck and a guy up on the roof. Load them up there and then the guy takes them off and puts them on the roof. Or what they're going to now, which really saves a lot of lifting and carrying, at least on the truck end, is uh, picking up an entire pallet of shingles, bundles, and put them on the roof and they still have to break it down and disperse them throughout the roof. But uh, here's an engineering control that really saves a lot of exposure from uh, lifting, like I say, at least on the truck end of it. They still have to lift once they're up there. Anyway, this isn't the actual picture, but uh, so they had a commercial job, this crew. They were using this very crane uh, but this commercial job, I think, with the parapet up there was probably a good 24 feet to clear it and then put the, the roofing materials on the, on the roof. So it's a flat roof, so they were loading tar and, and such. Um, they rolled up to the job, and they always bring a ladder, but they had a ladder that was not long enough. So I think they had maybe like a... 18 foot ladder and they probably needed something 24 plus 3 so a good 30 foot ladder to get up over that parapet so being uh, showing ingenuity what do you think they did they wrote up on the point well yeah they could have done that <laughs> they didn't they knew that was illegal, so they at least followed that rule. In fact, even the conveyor, if they had the conveyor, uh, OSHA says you can climb the conveyor, but you can't ride it, which is interesting. Uh, this is what they did. First, they tried putting the ladder on the back of the truck. It's a big flatbed truck, so they, they got about four feet, but it wasn't quite enough. So they had to take the one guy, and he stood and lifted the ladder while the other guy climbed up. And he actually made it. He got up over, over the parapet and onto the roof. Did the work, but then he had to get down. So they did the same procedure. He held the ladder. Just, it was only up maybe two feet. The other guy kind of dropped down on it, though. And when he dropped, it was just too much weight. And, and he went to the grass. So he was up good, well, with his feet dangling down, he was probably a good 20 foot drop. So just like the man that landed on his elbows, this man landed on both ankles, actually just standing up but shattered. Just a young kid, 22, 23 years old. Um, very expensive injury. He'll never be the same. It's just like the, the man that shattered his elbows. Uh, you can heal from those things, but mentally he still has it and probably won't. And physically, you'll always, you know, when you have that many fractures, um, and with all the hardware they have to put in you, you'll, you're just never the same. So it's just not worth taking, you know, those shortcuts like they did. Now, it was interesting talking to both the individuals involved in this. Um, 
they were not prepared for the job. In other words, if, if at least, and this is typically how it's supposed to work, so there's a breakdown kind of on several level, levels. They could have run back to the shop and gotten the right ladder for the job. They could even call their supervisor and have him, have him run it out, the ladder. Probably would have been quicker. Um, the sales ticket, when they write up a job, they're supposed to indicate on the sales ticket that, you know, how high the roof is, and so then they can prepare what kind of equipment they're going to need. They probably would have had the right ladder, but that wasn't done, and they didn't have the right ladder, and they didn't call their supervisor, and they didn't go back to the shop to get the right ladder, but what they did do, do is what I just told you, uh, which was a disaster. Um, come to find out, uh, when I was asking them, I said, why didn't you call uh, the supervisor? And <coughs> They were in fear of their job, basically, for putting the supervisor out to run out there. And I don't know if this had happened before, but uh, just not a good relationship between supervisor and employee, which was one problem in and of itself, which was rectified. Um, I tell you this story, though, because a lot of times, um, like I say, if they would have been better prepared, this probably wouldn't have happened. Now, if, if, if you were in charge of having somebody uh, maintain this facility, and let's say there was a, a ballast out in this light here, and, and you sent your people out, and let's say they only had, uh, well, this probably isn't a good example, because most step ladders you have are probably at least eight footers. But let's say the ceiling was 16 feet high, and they only had an eight footer. And so to do the job, they were either going to have to go up past the second step on the, lap, on the ladder or even stand on the top of the ladder to get the job done, which happens a lot. You see people a lot standing on that top step of a, an A-frame ladder. Um, do you think your people would take the time to go back to the shop to get the proper ladder for the job? in general, if they didn't have it with them, and they're going to have to go all the way back. What do you think, just in general, would they do it? Oh, probably not. And so, uh, my point in bringing this up, and this, I, I give you a handout here. Um, when we talk about tools, yeah, they have to have the right tools for the job, whether it's ladder, hand tools, power tools, but in addition, uh, there's also written tools that will help you with regard to making sure your people are better prepared, I think, for the job at hand, and then even better trained for the job. So this first one's called a, what we call a pre-task plan. And it said, uh, and this is, this pre-task planning tool is, uh, was born basically in the construction industry. In fact, a lot of contractors and subcontractors that I work with are replacing this tool with even their daily or weekly toolbox talks. So they get together for a meeting, they're doing away with those, and they're having these little pre-task plan huddles. And basically it's what, what it says up here. It says, prior to each day's work, a pre-task plan shall be reviewed with each crew. Changing conditions require reassessment and updating of the completed pre-task plan and may require them to do another one. So this is kind of how it works. They get together beginning of the day, if crews or supervisors or foremen on a construction site, and they go through the day. And they use this little tool here, and uh, they, at least on this site here, there's certain things that you have to have certifications in. Well, these first two are on pin guns, and here's a boom lift training and then follow us training. Those certifications have to be done or they can't even work on the job site. So things like this may or may not be applicable to what you do. But I wanted to just give you an idea or a, kind of some boilerplate here of maybe what you could do in putting together your own little pre-task plan like this. And, you know, kind of in the same vein. Then they go through, once they've made sure their certifications are current, um, then they go through the, the safety of the day. You know, if they're going to be erecting scaffolding, do we have the right people to do that? Do we have our green tags? Make sure they're inspected properly. 
Uh, if we're going to be using ladders, do we have the right tool for the job? Do we have A-frames uh, that we need? Do we have extension and, and straight ladders that we need? And do we have the right heights that we're going to you know, be using them for? Uh, if we're working above uh, falls at six foot, are we going to, do we have our fall protection harnesses and anchorage points and things like that? So you go through all these things. Uh, now, I'd be glad if you're interested in, in getting an electronic version of this. I like this little idea of doing a pre-task plan, but certainly you'd want to customize something to fit your own needs. Uh, so I'd be glad to send this to you electronically, but they go through, they identify the hazards, they make sure they have the right tools. Talk about the second one here, neutralize hazards. Uh, elimination, substitution, engineering, administrative. There's kind of this hierarchy of controls that uh, use in the safety field that you look at a hazard and then you try to eliminate it as best you can. If it can't be eliminated, what other things can we do to control the risk of the hazard? To better control it so your people do not get hurt. Classic example. Let's say you have a job where something, uh, maybe it's a piece of machinery, creates a lot of noise. What would that be? What do you use now that maybe there's a lot of noise involved with using it? Hammer drill. Hammer drill? Okay. Do you people, uh, are they required to wear personal protective equipment when they use it? Okay. What, uh, and really the bottom thing, and I don't have it on here, when it comes to controlling hazards, personal protective wear is certainly one way of controlling certain hazards, noise being one of them. But whatever, regardless of what it is we're controlling with purse protective equipment, whether it's safety glasses, respirators, hard hats, earplugs, what are we relying upon for that to work effectively? Yeah, yeah. and uh, that decision to one, put it on, and put it on properly, and, and maintain it, keep it on. Uh, and that's a big if. Again, we're going back to this decision making. If we can eliminate that decision making, perhaps engineer out the hazard or other controls that, uh, that we could utilize to eliminate the, even the need for personal protective equipment, well then that's a win-win situation there. Now, the, the roto hammer probably is not a good uh, example of this because it is uh, something that is mobile and whenever you use it, it's going to be moved around. And so using earplugs or earmuffs is probably going to be the most effective means of controlling the noise. But if you had, let's say, a piece of machinery that's in your shop uh, and creates a, a lot of noise, as opposed to telling people to wear earplugs when you use that, what other thing could you do? Okay, maybe isolate it. Either isolate the machine, whether that's in a, in a room, or using barriers, or in some, in some cases you can actually, in, uh, if it's involving pneumatics, you can actually exhaust the noise out to the exterior of the building. So these are some engineering controls. Administrative controls would be something like, well, we've got a, a fellow that's going to be operating that machine, and he the only what thing we can do is provide protective equipment for him. Uh, but we're going to limit how often he uses that machine, or we're going to use job rotation. So let's say we got one guy on there for two hours, or bring in a different guy for two hours, and you rotate that through. So that limits the exposure to noise. So that's an administrative control. So when you when you look at trying to minimize and control the hazards to your your employees out there, think about this uh, method of hierarchy of control and see if, you know, there are ways to eliminate. I mean, are there things out there that you do now, or Neil, let's say, things that you used to do that you now have somebody else do? So maybe contract that out, uh, uh, whatever that be. Um, I'm trying to think what, what it would be. Well, like the fire sprinklers. You guys don't do that, right? But 
you don't do it because you have to be certified to do it, I, I gather. Um, do you go into confined spaces at all? Why wouldn't you? Or do you have them? You don't have them? Okay. So, well. Uh, fertilization, like on our grounds, uh, for many years we didn't do it. Uh, I got a guy in that was certified to do that. Okay. And so we started doing it. Well, he left employment and looked at all the qualifications to have him have our new employee certified doing that and looked at the, the risk and the cost. Back to having a third party do that. So economic means maybe drove that. A lot of times, oh, it could be safety. I mean, but if you that, that's the other thing. Oh well, yeah. We just don't want that risk of putting something out and hurting somebody and having the wrong dilution or something, and you know, the, the, those type of requirements to handle those chemicals. You know, we can transfer that to somebody else to do it. Well, that's a, an effective risk management technique, you either transfer, you've basically eliminated the exposure to you by transferring to somebody else. And that may be, you know, something to look at when it comes to some of these higher hazard type uh, operations that maybe you're involved with. Um, now, I'll have to uh, apologize because the back side of that uh, little handout that was supposed to be this side of it, which had safety, quality, production, and it talked about some of these other things. You've only got a duplicate of the front page, but uh, like I say, if, if I send it to you electronically, it'll be in, in this form here. Uh, but it talks about your near-miss reports and action taken to prevent recurrence and things like that. Bottom line is this little tool here, I think, is an excellent way of better preparing your people, especially before they get out in the field for the day's work, and making sure that they have everything they need uh, so they're not more apt to do or take shortcuts because they're not prepared. So I just wanted to throw that in. The other thing I wanted to, uh, another little tool here is many times we focus when it comes to safety on where we see most frequency of injuries. I asked you at the onset here, where we have, where you see your injuries. And we're talking about material handling and slip trips, falls, and maybe handcuffs. Those are the, probably the top three frequent injuries we see in most, most industries, honestly. What we tend to maybe put on the back burner or not place much emphasis or as much emphasis or focus is where we have the potential for serious injuries and even fatalities. And by serious, I mean maybe life altering type of of uh, injuries. Now I don't know if we have much of that in, in what you do, but to some extent we have it in every, every industry. Well, where we find most of the serious injuries and fatalities is this little uh, graphic I've got here. It's working in and around traffic, so exposure to moving vehicles, or actually driving vehicles, like heavy equipment here or it's in lockout tagout situations where maybe somebody's working with power or some other energy source uh, it's confined spaces that we're just talking about and it's work at heights and one other i'll add in there that where we tend to see this potential for serious injury and fatality is when people are expected to do jobs on a very infrequent basis that maybe are more of a hazardous nature. So if it's something that maybe you have your people only do once or twice a year and they're not as familiar with that task, and again there's some kind of higher hazard associated with it, this is where we tend to see more serious injuries. So I give you this graphic just to maybe again dress with your people let's kind of cut off at the top here but you want to make sure again the beginning of the day you ask them what am i about to do what could hurt me or others what must i do to protect myself and others now this one again is more focused on the serious injury fatality potential but you could use this with any and come up with a little mnemonic like this they've got here teach t-e-e-c-h so it's the traffic 
equipment, energy, confined space, and hives. I guess I would suspect that for you, some of this to some extent is still applicable. You have worked maybe around or with vehicles, certainly heavy equipment, forklifts, things like that. Now, I think we rule out confined spaces. Does anybody in here go into confined spaces with your facilities personnel? There's crawl spaces in the building. Okay, that's probably considered to be confined space. Um, whether it's permit or not, that's something I'd probably have to be determined. But again, when you're getting into these spaces, there's typically a, a higher risk for some type of something to go wrong. So, uh, and then work at height. So, uh, you know, utilize this as a tool and uh, maybe even come up with something on your own. I have clients that have taken something like this and customized it to kind of fit their own operation. I mean, for, for you folks, maybe it's, when we talk about work from heights, maybe it's ladders. Uh, what, are, what are some of the other exposures you have out there for significant injury? Well, like, would you have lockout situations? I'll lock a roof. Fall off a roof, so again, uh, uh, heights. So I, my point in bringing this up is sometimes we tend to not think about the serious injury fatality potential because we rarely see it. But it's still out there. And most of our training efforts are put on the frequency side. Our material handling and slips and things like that. Not that we shouldn't train, but don't forget this side of your operations. So look at what they do and where you can have these potentials. I mean, and just address them like you do with this uh, pre-task plan. And it, it should have them ask those questions before they go out to do those activities and make sure that, uh, you know, the proper precautions are taken. If you also have higher hazard risks, I like this little tool, and you probably used it. Uh, this isn't anything new, but the job safety analysis or job hazard analysis. Uh, I put up a, a sample here of one that we did with uh, a tool rental company where they're having a lot of injuries with people uh, straining their back, lifting trailers uh, onto hitches and things like that. Basically, you want to take the task, whatever it is, and break it into steps like this. So this one I've got, uh, the task is hooking up a trailer to the hitch. Once the... Uh, First task, what's directing the vehicle to the trailer? Hazard, backing in people and objects. What are the controls? Make sure path is clear, make sure driver can see you and understand your hand signals. Don't put yourself between the trailer and the vehicle. Direct the vehicle as close to the trailer as possible to minimize the, the need to, to move it. So this is kind of the, the process in this tool. You break it down into steps, identify the task, the hazard, and then the controls. Now this is an excellent tool to use, especially for new hires. If you've got new people and you've got things like this put together, uh, have them sit down and go through this. And then have them demonstrate the skill, like we were talking about earlier with the training. This is also an excellent tool to use for any of these serious injury and fatality potentials. So if you've got a higher hazard type task, I think it's incumbent upon us to provide something like this, whether it's a job safety analysis or maybe it's just a standard operating procedure, that they know how to do the job properly so they don't get there. Then we work on some of these other things to help make sure they make proper decisions in, in following the, the procedure once you set it out. But uh, anybody use these at all in their operations? Okay. Is this new to anybody? Well, I, I, uh, I've included in your packet here the sample one, and then there's a blank here if, uh, if you wanted to make copies. Or again, I'd be glad to send any of this uh, to you electronically, just email it to you uh, so you could have it and, again, customize it, kind of fit your own operation. But this is pretty straightforward here. Um, just lastly, I was going to say that uh, risk assessment. A lot of times we'll use something similar to, uh, well, these little uh, matrices. This is a, a method of kind of prioritizing your, your hazards out there. If you've got something that uh, 
you do quite frequently. And there is a, on the probability side, almost certain that you could have an injury or could happen or unlikely or extremely unlikely. And on this side, you have the severity potential. Well, if you did get an injury, would it be minimal, moderate, severe, maybe a major event? And we talk about this serious injury and fatality potential. Uh, you go through and you mark that off. So if you have a moderate, uh, let's say, something in severity, but uh, unlikely that the uh, event could occur, well, that's a C and a class C hazard. Continue with the task. Complete actions required to eliminate uh, and manage hazards. So basically, if you've got good controls in place, you don't have to do anything beyond that. But if it rates in maybe the yellow or red, then you maybe want to stop and use something like the job hazard analysis to make sure you're following proper procedure, things like that. I have one company here that took this little matrices and combined it with a job hazard or job safety analysis. They call it their activity hazard analysis. This one happened to be for work from ladders. These guys do drywall. And uh, they've gone through and they identified, oh, probably a dozen of their higher risk hazards. Anything from using a chop saw to getting up on scaffolding or ladders, and they developed one of these little activity hazard analysis. One of these for each one of those, and then they use this in training. Uh, now this one I do not have electronically, but it possibly could to acquire, but I just wanted to show it to you as an example of things you could do uh, with these job safety analysis to just kind of customize it to fit your own operation. Uh, so working from ladders, they better, again, identify the, the task, the hazard, and then what they do to eliminate uh, the potential for hazard, and then they train on this. So I, my intent was to give you some tools out there to use to help people be better prepared. I wanted to just end with this last story here to make sure that uh, we're not the problem. So we're doing a job walkthrough. Now this isn't the actual picture, but it was very similar. It was this company I was just mentioning here, Drywall. And uh, we're walking through the job site and we come upon a chop saw, similar to the miter saw. And it had the, the uh, blade, blade guard negated or circumvented like this one here. Somebody's taken a wedge and put the uh, put it between the guard and the saw, and basically have taken this guard out of use, it's of no use in that condition or situation. Why do people do things like that? You ever seen somebody bypass a guard? Have you ever done it yourself? Why do you do it? Okay, and that's the typical response. Dirty, gets dirty. Dirty, you can't see. Uh, binds up on you maybe, uh, especially on table saws. I get that a lot. People can't perform the cut, binds and can't see, so people pull the guard off and then it never gets put on again. Um, so we start doing a little investigating on this chop saw. And of course, typically when you see something like this, immediately you start thinking, well, who had done this and why? They basically compromised safety for everybody else. They bypassed the guard. The guard didn't seem to function properly. <coughs> this was on a metal chop saw, not a wood one like this. So it is metal. So as you come down, it works similar to this, but it's not an issue of can't see through it because it's not transparent anyway. So after we did a little investigating, what do you think the, the cause of why somebody bypassed it? Any ideas? 